This show is brought to you by the Email Laundry, making email safe for your customers. Visit www.theemaillaundry.com forward slash tublog for a very special listener offer and to have your MSP's domain filtered by the Email Laundry for free. You're listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners with our featured conversation with Richard Tubb and Brad Benner of Smileback. My name is Jeff Nicholson, and this podcast is all about helping you grow your IT business. In this episode, Richard talks with Brad Benner, the founder of Berlin-based Smileback. Brad is a serial IT entrepreneur, and his business, Smileback, helps MSPs to increase customer satisfaction and build brand loyalty. This episode was recorded via a video call between Richard at home in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, England, and Brad in Berlin, Germany. And now, without further ado, here's Richard Tubb talking with Brad Benner. Hi everyone, Richard Tubb here again, and today I'm joined by Brad Benner. Now, Brad is the founder of Smileback, the client service experience product that's become a vital tool for many IT companies. Uh, Smileback is successfully used today by over 600 IT solution providers in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. And those customers, uh, they credit Smileback with helping them to get in tune with their own customers, uh, building closer relationships with them over a longer term. And I understand that Smileback helps them to set value-based pricing. Now, Brad's story is after selling his own MSP business, which was based in Seattle just over five years ago, uh, he started to decide, he decided to start Smileback with the conviction that customer experience is the only sustainable competitive advantage that leads to organic growth in revenue. Brad then moved from the USA to Europe, specifically Berlin, Germany, where he's joining me from today, and he has run Smileback for a number of years. Uh, Just a little thing about Brad, he speaks three languages, English, obviously, which we're going to conduct the interview in today, German, uh, and also Spanish. And Brad is a former recipient of the US Small Business Administration Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Uh, Now, Brad shares that his vision is to create value by always striving to understand the customer's mindset and harness it to support growth and guide innovation. Brad, thank you so much for joining me today. Yes, thanks. It's it's actually quite a quite a treat for me to be here with you today, Richard. Thank you. Oh, cheers. And how are things across there in uh, Berlin and Germany today? You know, it's sunny. It's uh, we went out for lunch today as a team, which we do on Thursdays. We have team lunch Thursdays and. Um, the sun is shining, it's radiant, and how could you not be in a good mood when that's the case? It's been, uh, we kind of had a cold, cold spring here so far, so we're super excited about the sun. Fantastic. Now, tell me a bit more about Smileback. For people who are not familiar with it, you mentioned the team, how many people within Smileback, and tell me a bit more about Smileback as a business. Yeah, happy to. Um, so we started this project two years ago, my co-founder and I, Henrik, and um, we're seven today. We're sitting here all in Berlin, um, a multi-culture team. We've got a couple, uh, we've got myself from the U.S., we've got uh, one of my colleagues from the U.K., another one from Romania, one from India via Australia, and uh, three Germans uh, to boot. So very cultural team. You know, we, we, um, we've been building this platform for the last two years and, um, it's really focused on helping customers get actionable insight from, excuse me, helping companies. So I'm going to start over. <laughs> Uh, Smileback is all about helping companies get actionable insights from their customers and specifically focused on helping them understand what their customers' experience is. As you said, we believe that um, understanding and being attuned with the customer's experience is really, and in fact, providing excellent customer service is the only competitive advantage that companies uh, really can have these days. We think it's super important, um, you know, we see in you know all over if you look in the world you'll find instances of of really awful atrocious customer service and and the impact that that has both for the customers themselves which obviously is important but also for the businesses i think united is a is a good recent example of that yeah, absolutely. So we'll talk more about Smileback uh, and the product itself in a minute. Um, but before we do, I think it's really interesting your own journey to founding Smileback. I've alluded to it. You used to run an MSP. Uh, tell me more about that journey and what it looked like. Yeah, I started. Um, I started my company in Seattle in 2012. I think it was 
like uh, 23 or 24 at the time. Really was not, sh- nobody should have given me a license to run a company <laughs> at that age. A lot of learning happened. Um, and, you know, we did a lot of things in the beginning, but what really became a core part of the business, our core focus over the years was um, providing IT solutions to, to companies in, in, the, in the Seattle area. Um, and, you know, we became an MSP much like um, many IT solution providers were doing at that time. We made the conversion and we're billing, uh, offering fixed fee, all-inclusive, um, so, you know, ongoing support to these companies. You know, we were a small company and um, I was really invested in our customers, really like personally, emotionally invested in the relationships I had built. We were five at the time when I when I sold my company in 2010. I mean, it was that connection and that investment on my part and uh, that really set the stage for a lot of really rewarding interactions. But once in a while, we would lose clients and it really killed me. It like crushed my soul. And often it was, um, it was surprising. Honestly, it was something that um, I didn't see coming. And, uh, and I didn't see, you know, and, and, and it would ha- you know, I'd sit down with a client and like, you know, sorry, we're, we're, we're moving over to another provider. And, um, you know, I thought, gosh, we really have to be able to see this. And not only it's, it's, it's even more about going way upstream to understand, okay, what is the customer's journey and how were we interacting with these companies and what were we not seeing that we could have been seeing and learning? So that was kind of, I mean, yeah, that was a, a big it was a big challenge for us and it was something that really impacted me while I was there. And you and I first met, I can't remember how many years ago it is now, but we were actually colleagues at HTG, the Heartland yep. Technology Group, um, which for people who are not familiar is uh, an IT peer group, in fact, one of the, uh, the biggest and the best in the world. What influence of peer groups like HTG had on your business journey? Well, uh, really important impacts. Um, I mean, two things come immediately to mind. One is um, HCG has done an excellent job at creating a culture of um, collaboration and openness, which uh, which flies in the face of kind of the default um, attitude that most businesses business owners have towards other business owners. It's always this sort of like, mm, what are you trying to get from me? Are you trying to compete? Are you going to take away what I have? This sort of, you know... Um, zero sum game of like you know there's not enough so that I have to be on guard with with you you know and and HCG really has done an amazing job at creating a different attitude which is that you know together uh, through collaboration through learning through share knowledge sharing that um, in fact we all in fact do better right it's that it's that sort of rising tides lifts uh, all boats. So that's one thing I really respect about the organization. For me personally, what I got out of it um, was uh, the discipline and the know-how to take um, a very small business that I had started and build it into something that had value and that I could sell eventually, uh, which I did in 2010. So basically all of the value that I you know, was fortunate enough to kind of get out of the business when I exited, that I built all during the time I was in HTG, right? So HTG, if you think of, um, you know, it is a set of systems that you learn in terms of, you know, what are, what are the disciplines that have to be present to be successful? And there's lots of them. Uh, that's, you know, that was like on, on, on the ground training every quarter as I would show up, up to those meetings. So, um, yeah, it was, it was a great experience. Yeah. And I think we we both actually sold our MSP businesses within a few months of each other in the same year, 2010, and we were both members of HTG. So just yeah. to um, uh, to reiterate all the thing, all the good things you said about HTG, yeah, really, really positive. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here a minute, uh, Brad, because um, I was asked this question uh, uh, the other day. Before we move on from the subject of your uh, MSP business, if you were to start an M- an MSP business again tomorrow, what would it look like? Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, the thing I'm always struck by, even today, as I interact with our the, co- the companies that use our product, which are in large part still IT solution providers, MSVs. Um, there's so always so much conversation about feeds and features and technology and devices and this and stacks and you know these these very sort of technical terms. It's 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 the uh, it's a, it's the ver- vision of the world through technology, right? And I'm always wondering, okay, what's the vision of the world through people? Like, what is, uh, what are their needs? What are their hopes? What are their desires? What are they trying to do to bring this 
bit more tangible or relevant to the to, to the business day, right? What are they trying to get done? What are they What are they wanting to accomplish? What's getting in their way of doing that? And I think if you understand the world from that perspective, then you build a very different type of business, right? You real you build a business that's 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 uh, focused on solving problems that people are running into, and of course, this, there's going to be solution sets that you have to you know that that, that go grow out of that idea. But if you start with the people first, the people at the center of the equation, then um, it's a very different, the companies look different, right? So that's one key thing. The other key thing is that um, customer experience is king, right? It's the, it's the most important thing. And when you start to look at, again, the world from the, from, through, the, through the lens of the customer, through the eyes of the customer, then you start saying, you start seeing that there, there's a journey that starts, right, and nurtures over, you know, develops over time as you, right, the, your first in, uh, interaction with the customer, how you introduce yourself, the way you conduct yourself, how you manage those conversations, and then the journey through them becoming a client and then delivering service and the life cycle that, that develops there. So it's not just about, you know, one specific touch point. Are they happy? Are they not? Were they frustrated or not? But you rather see an entire journey. And it's understanding that journey from beginning to end that becomes a very key element to success uh, for businesses. Brad, I think that's the most thoughtful answer I've ever heard to a question like that. So thank you for sharing that with us. Most people usually talk about the tools and techniques. Um, I think you're, much, you're talking much more about the vision and the philosophy there. I like it. Let's move forward a little bit then. Um, so you're joining us today from Berlin in Germany. Um, why the move from Seattle to Berlin? Uh, great question. So I sold my MSP, as I said, we've talked about in 2010. Um, my goal was to take some time off and um, just to kind of decelerate from a very intense few years. Um, I went kind of five-month trip starting in India, and my end goal was to get to Mongolia um, in the June time frame that year. After being in India for seven weeks, I realized what I had inadvertently done was create a massive project for myself. <laughs> so I, running a company... And then I created another project for myself. And the project involved traveling through five countries in the span of five months. And it was very, you know, so I had this like moment in India where I was like, you know what, I don't, I'm on, I'm not working now. Like I don't have to, this doesn't have to be this intense. Like this can be whatever I want it and I can give myself the permission to be whatever it is. So I actually ended up scrapping the trip after India. I was there for two months, amazing experience. Um, also very intense experience and um, went to visit a friend in London and then was sort of like, okay, I've got a couple months for came to Berlin, had been here once before, and the, the city has a credible feel. It's, it's the, the streetscapes, the parks. Um, I don't know how to describe it. It, it. People always ask, and I'm always like trying to search for the words, but it, it really has this incredible feel and energy to it. Um, so that's what attracted me to the city, and then what kept me here. So I, you know, I stayed, and I didn't want to leave, and I kept coming back over the course of that year, and then ultimately moved here in the fall of 2011. Um, and what kept, you know, what, what's kept me here over time has been a really great um, environment and 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 uh, atmosphere to build a company. Costs are super low, super reasonable here um, compared to certainly the U.S. and any of the other sort of major startup, you know, cities in the world. Berlin offers some some really great advantages from that perspective. All of that primarily stemming from the fact that the cost of living here is ultra affordable. It's not, you know, I can go out and have dinner for 10 euros or 12 euros and in the U S it would be $50, right. You know, and you can't, you can't compete against that. And I, so I was really drawn to this notion that like the, you know, the proverbial rat race that we, we seem to, to, to be in love with in the U S um, that, that in fact, maybe there was a different way of living and, and, and with, I, I had this theory that, okay, yeah, maybe I could start a company here and, and that would prove out to be, a, a, an advantage for us and it has been I love it I love it and I love Berlin by the way I've been there a few times myself absolutely gorgeous city so Let, let's talk a bit more about Smallback now then if we can so you talked a little bit about your background but what was really the main motivation for you creating a tool that essentially helps MSPs measure customer satisfaction yeah I mean it goes back to that story I was sharing with you I remember um, when I was in Seattle you know, I guess I'm, I guess in the end of the day, I'm a super sensitive guy. And, um, and you know, when I like people, I really like them and I become very invested in the relationships. And, uh, I had this customer, it was a small financial services firm. And, um, you know, I, you know, I really thought of these people more, more than just a 
client and more than just a customer of ours. And I walked into a meeting one day and was felt like I just had been like broadsided with that, you know, with the announcement that they were leaving us. And um, it was like a kick in the stomach to, you know, with all of the same physical experience of what that feels like, um, you know, and then the question, then of course, so there's some soul searching that comes out of that. It's like, well, what, what did we do? Of course, the immediate question is like, what did we do wrong? And, you know, how could how could I have prevented this, right? And that's a bit, it's really a reactionary, it is, it was exactly that. It was a reaction to what had just happened. And then if you sort of, you know, relax, like not relax, but give give the, the topic a little bit of space and calm down from it, or what I did anyway, um, and then I started to realize that there was a whole, there was a whole journey that we weren't paying attention to, right? It didn't start, it didn't, like that problem that, you know, it wasn't one problem, it was, a, it was the culmination of many things, many things that created um, minor tensions, right? Dissatisfactions, disappointments along the way that we weren't uh, paying attention to. And if we had been, um, you know, actually, you know, the interesting thing is that we were trying, we had um, these surveys that we were sending out at the end of every service, like support case through ConnectWise. And, uh, you know, I went back and looked at that system thinking, okay, well, did we, were there any like early warning signs, any any pieces of information that we had been collecting on the way that were somehow, that we just were ignoring? And it turns out actually part of the problem there is that system wasn't working. So it was that direct experience of trying to use um, the sort of the built-in surveys within ConnectWise to get this type of feedback and then just realizing that that wasn't working, it wasn't producing the results that ultimately we needed, that sent me down this journey of, okay, I have to believe this is a common problem and a common struggle. In fact, my experience with HCG for example, proved that to be true. So I set out to build a, build a solution for that. And for me, we uh, it was really important for us to do it elegantly and make sure that um, that our subscribers were getting super high uh, volumes of feedback. Right, really solve this problem of response rates. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, in the days running up to this interview, I actually put out on social media that I was mm -hmm. uh, going to interview you, going to do a podcast interview, and ask for any questions, as well as a number of questions, which we'll come to in a minute. The uh, feedback from some of your customers, wow, overwhelmingly positive. So you talk about customer satisfaction, but from Smartback's perspective, you've got some really, really engaged customers who love your tool. Thank you. Um, I don't take it, uh, compliments are a little difficult for me sometimes. <laughs> I'm blushing over here, Richard. Um, that's very kind of you to say. And, um, you know, yeah, it's a real treat for me to be able to go out into the world. Um, we were at IT Nation in Europe two weeks ago, and, um, you know, we have customers come by and they're, very, you know, they're enthusiastic and they are very effusive with their enthusiasm with us. And that's like such, like, isn't that the only reason to be in business, right? Is yeah. to like have have been able to create that that moment. Um, so it's yeah, I cherish those. Um, we you know we're also not perfect. We're also learning, right? We 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 use Smile Back for our own support operations. I've been super pleased with um, we you know with with the progression that we've made, and we're hitting some really great numbers now, and that's super exciting. Um, but it's a journey. We're we're learning along the way, and um, our you know our partners, our MSP. Um, partners, they obviously spend a lot of time thinking about like service delivery. And so we take every opportunity to try to learn from them when, when we have those moments. Mm. But on that subject, every IT company I come across, certainly, and I think it's true across the board, every IT company says they deliver excellent customer service. I don't think anybody's going to put the hand up and say, no, no, we deliver shocking customer service. But <laughs> in your, in your experience, Brad, what are the typical mistakes you see IT companies making when it comes to customer service? Well, I mean, the first thing is is that they're not they're not trying to actively measure measure it or measure, measure client satisfaction specifically, nor they're nor are they actively listening, right? So the first mistake is to say you have great customer service, but are not able to back it up, right? And and to actually to demonstrate that that there is a system and process and an eco you know an ecosystem in place to to gather that information. Um, we also see that like uh, you know that it's sort of what I was saying earlier that that companies are can be a bit myopic about it and see, okay, well, it's 
they don't realize that it's really there's a, that there's a journey that begins you know much much before the support engineer is having or support technicians having an interaction with the end user right that that's one piece of a much larger uh, experience right and so maybe it, so so one of the big mistakes is just not looking at it and realizing that there's a there's a whole experience there that needs to be understood and needs to be uh, followed right following the journey through the following the customer through the journey. Um, um, so I think those are kind of the, the major mistakes. Um, you know, the other piece of the puzzle that we often see or we also see that's missing is that customers, uh, MSPs are, are asking for feedback and either they have a system that just doesn't work, which is super common, unfortunately, with MSPs. They'll have implemented the survey. They're not even looking at the results, possibly because they're just not getting any. That's super common. And we, we've that was, very frequently. Um, and then, of course, if they are, so let's say they have a system in place that's getting, you know, good, good, uh, a good stream of incoming pieces of feedback, uh, they don't have a process in place for how to react to it, right? To look for those actionable insights, to understand um, what sort of stories and that they can draw from the information that's being collected and how they then take that as a sort of a positive feedback loop into the rest of the business and say, okay, we wanna, we're going to focus on these three initiatives this quarter because we think it's going to have this positive impact on the end user or the end customer. Um, it's that discipline that's often missing. So, you know, most companies Somebody's not asking for feedback. Those that are are not doing it effectively, and those that are have an effective system in place, perhaps just to get the feedback, they're not really listening. Right? I'll tell you one thing. I hear from MSPs occasionally. They're like, they'll want to argue with the feedback, right? And they'll be like, but that's not true. We're not that way. And it's and I always I always my, the corners of my mouth always go up because I I get I understand right I. Because I've been that person, that person personally, and you know that 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 guy personally invested in those relationships. Um, but from my perspective, like the cust- customer feed, you know, there's this expression that the customer's always right. We don't have to debate that piece. But the customer's experience is true, right? In the sense that, like, when you're angry, I may not agree with you why or what set, you know, what con- created the conditions for you to be upset. But your experience is still real, right? You're still feeling that emotion. You still like that is still your experience, right? And so I always find it sort of interesting. It's like, okay, yes, you may think that it's not fair or justified, but the customer, that's their experience. And it's, isn't that a great opportunity to listen and to take that in? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, companies almost putting their collective ego first when they argue with people about the customer yeah. service they've got. Because as you say, you know, there's there's different sides to every story. But what they what the customer experiences is absolutely true from their perspective. So, um, I, I guess a quick sort of um, not really a technical question, but in terms of uh, MSPs that are listening in uh, to this call today, uh, what is the typical uh, percentage response rate? that MSPs should expect or that you see in the market for MSPs who do survey their customers? Well, we designed our platform to specifically fix this problem of low response rates, and we did it through uh, clever design. Um, you know, we try not to use the word survey because survey is a four-letter word for most people. I mean, we all, like, collectively hate surveys, don't we, right? <laughs> um, so rather, we use smiley faces, and um, it was through that design decision of using three smiley faces with a very simple question, which is, uh, how did we do on this request? Three smiley faces, the brain. And it turns out the brain processes emojis and smiley faces in the same way or very similar way as the human face. So there's a very, very low effort required for the end user to very quickly um, decide how they want to respond to that question and click the face that, that matches their level of satisfaction. And it's that design that became really key to the success of our product. Um, and so as a result, our subscribers, our partners get on average a 39% uh, 39.1, I believe it was, as I last looked. Um, and we have partners getting, of course, that's an average, so you, it goes on both sides. We have some getting up to 60%, 70% response rates. That's phenomenal. Like, yeah. when was when do you ever get a, a response rate for anything these days in those numbers, right? So it was super, um, we were really excited to see those results because it was the problem we set out to solve. And when the numbers came in and we could see that metric, we're like, yes, we did it. Um, you know, as just to quickly compare other uh, survey methods like sending a link out 
route that the user has to click and then answer questions, and those can be, I don't know, one to 20 questions. You've had the unending Microsoft surveys, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> get those almost <laughs> daily, it seems. Um, those surveys typically get in the single digits. So we hear, like, often 1% to 5%. And of course, the challenge is, is that if you're only hearing of that one to five percent, like what sort of conclusions can you draw, right? Anybody who's taken an intro to, to statistics class knows that you need a, a sufficient sample size to extract meaning from the information or even start to, 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 to paint a picture, right? To use a bunch of metaphors, mixed metaphors, but yeah. Yeah. I guess putting myself, what I like to do in these interviews, Brad, is to put myself in the place of the MSP um, mm-hmm. who's going to be listening in. Now, I know there's going to be a lot of MSPs who, uh, first of all, say their customer service is great, so they don't need to worry about measuring it and things. But in your experience, what are the dangers of ignoring customer satisfaction levels? So if you don't survey them at all, you just assume that everything's good. Can you give me any examples you've seen of uh, MSPs, IT companies, typically ignoring customer satisfaction levels? Well, sure. I mean, we we hear this all the time. I mean, we we hear from companies um, who you know often say, "Oh no, our customers, you know, our they're satisfied. We know." And I always ask, mm-hmm. "How?" And they're like, "Oh, we just do." I'm like, okay, well, you know, do we want to debate this? Sure, we can. I'm happy to. Um, you know, the thing is, is from my experience, and because I was one of those people, I was one of those MSP business owners that. Could have told. I would have made that statement, you know, seven years ago when I was running my company. Like, no, no, I really care about my customers. Ergo, they're satisfied, yeah. right? And you saw what happened to me. I walked in, got blindsided, lost a really key account for us, and uh, felt sick to my stomach for a few days. Um, yeah, I mean, sure, we can say we know, but in the end of the day, unless you're actively listening and making the effort to really ask for that feedback in a way that's appropriate and doesn't require a lot of effort. On the end of the, you know, on the part of the end user, then 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 you're not doing that, um, you know. And I think I think you know the other the other thing that comes to mind is um, we're much like my company today, which is the SaaS company. We uh, survive based on subscriptions, right? That model is very relevant to MSPs, right? So you look at the the financial engine that's at play that that that's that builds um, that, that directly results in the success of an MSP over time it's about keeping retaining revenue and what does that mean it means happy customers it means customers that clients that every month commit to coming back right and they say, and you know and that over the months and year quarters and years that they um, that they remain there and that they become the the swell of success that one builds over the lifetime of a business um, so you know that loyalty not, not listening to customers not giving them the opportunity to share their feedback in a way that's works for them that's meaningful to them and then not translating that satisfaction into customer loyalty that's that's the that's what we see co- companies really struggling with and it's why we've built built our product yeah and, and it's been my experience that those companies who say yeah yeah my clients are fine you know they love us and and you ask the question how do you know that and they go oh we just know well they've certainly not complained <laughs> is the one that i hear in my yeah. experience by the time a customer complains it's precariously close to the edge of losing that relationship full stop anyway so it's much better to know on an ongoing basis all these little niggling things that might build up into something bigger that uh, you know before uh, you lose the customer yeah i think uh, as i as i recall the statistics on um people actually taking the making the effort to share feedback only happens one in one in 20 times right so you've got um a lot of frustrated of customers who are walking around in the world saying, you know, potentially sharing that negative experience with their friends, their colleagues, other businesses that they know, and we're not even listening for it, right? That's a lot of frustration that we haven't had a chance to hear, we haven't had a chance to learn from, we haven't had a chance to figure out, okay, how do we reincorporate that back into our business? And you know what I'll say? I mean, think about, think about, um, the times when you've been really frustrated and you express that frustration and the person listens yeah. and that feeling of being heard, that is the, the, the most golden opportunity that businesses um, regularly 
forfeit, which is that they have an opportunity to turn that situation around. And, not, and it's not about getting it back to zero. It's not about neutralizing the dissatisfaction, but you actually have this opportunity to become, to transform that person into a champion, right? By just listening, by just literally hearing what they're saying and being present and, you know, and listening to it. So that's the, that's the golden opportunity that, that businesses routinely miss out on, right? And we, you know, we see it in the popular press, the really awful things that happen when the customer experience goes awry. I mean, there's been some interesting, really awful recent, you know, examples with, with you know, airlines and so forth. But I don't know. You know, it's it's um, we see it as a as a huge lost opportunity, and that opportunity is is a is a really competitive disadvantage um, when they're not, you know, have a good program in place. Yeah, and and on along those same lines, I was speaking to one of my MSP uh, clients the other day, and they were talk, they asked me the question, and I'll ask this to you. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you capture positive customer service experiences? Because I gave you some uh, very positive feedback from your client uh, just a few minutes ago and, and I've, I've made you blush. Um, mm-hmm. Is this common for MSPs to just say, oh, shucks, well, thanks. No, um, you know, uh, it was nothing and to move on. Do enough MSPs uh, capture the positive feedback? Any advice for MSPs on what they can do with that feedback? Yeah, you know, um, one of the fears I think uh, many companies have before they've actually implemented a, a feedback platform like Smileback is um, they're really afraid that there's going to be uh, this tidal wave of frustration and negativity that's going to come in. And it's a rational fear, right? We can, we can relate to that fear. What happens actually in our experience is that, first of all, the feedback that regularly comes in, it's not all bad, right? There are rays of sunshine, as we're having today here in Berlin, for example, uh, metaphorically speaking. But there's goodness that comes through. There's positivity. There's excitement. There's appreciation, first and foremost. Um, And so our system works just to kind of set the stage a little bit. Um, I talked about the smiley faces, and and it makes it very easy for the end user to just kind of click on the the green happy smiley face. They land on a page um, where they have the opportunity to leave a comment. It's completely optional. Um, what's really cool, what's really interesting and, and effective for, for, for companies is that, um, at least with Arsys, for example, I think it was 25% of respondents then actually go on to leave a comment. It was somewhere in the, in the 21 to 24%, as I seem to recall. So that's the comment rate. So all those people responding to the survey by clicking on a face, you know, another 20, 25% go on to actually leave a comment. And those aren't just negative comments. There's, as I said a moment ago, there's appreciation, there's praise, there's a lot of here's what you're doing right. You know, um, one of my experience being a manager and trying to grow employees and staff over time is, um, of course, it's very easy to always be looking for what's going wrong, right? Don't do that. That wasn't good enough. You know, this, you know, do less of that. But it, um, one of the other really key elements is shining the light on where success is being had, right? So like that thing you did, that way that you communicated that problem and the way that you interacted with your team to solve that, that was amazing. Do that because that had a really tangible and direct impact on this customer's experience. Now think about the power of that sort of very specific feedback. Also because it just, it makes life, I mean, we spend so much time working, like why not at least have an opportunity to see where we're having success, right? Because we're having success a lot of the time. In fact, most of the time, I'd argue, you know, people are actually doing the right thing. Um, And it's so easy just to sort of take that for granted as a business, right? Um, So, you know, there's there's these different aspects of the the feedback that comes in and, and how we see it really transforming organizations. Okay, I'd like to briefly pause for a second to let you know about my new book, The IT Business Owner's Survival Guide. I'm the former owner of an IT managed service provider business myself, so I know exactly what it's like to struggle to cope with the day-to-day stresses of running an IT business. I know there are days or even weeks when you get frustrated and wonder whether it's all worth it to go it alone. I'm telling you, it doesn't have to be like that. The IT Business Owner Survival Guide contains a collection of easy-to-digest guides and tips on how to cope with the common tasks that cause IT business owners worry and stress. If you want to learn how to save time, avoid stress, and build a successful IT business, then you don't have to do it alone. 
You can buy the IT Business Owner Survival Guide from Amazon or visit itbusinesssurvivalguide.com and download the first chapter for free. That's itbusinesssurvivalguide.com. There's a, there's a couple of clients that I work with, and they've actually implemented um, wow boards in the office. So when they get this fantastic feedback, because it's really easy, isn't it, to get the great feedback, to get the compliment, and just you know uh, shrug it off and, and say you know that's fine, it's all part of the job. But uh, um, we tend to take complaints a lot more seriously, which of course I can understand the rationale behind that. But celebrating um, that excellent customer feedback that you get, I think, is important. So the idea of having a wow board, you know, pinning stuff up to it and reminding yourself of the good work that you're doing there I, I think is uh, is important as well but I'll show you I'll yeah, just please, quick, I'm I'll show say, about, please uh, anecdote yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, one of our partners came up to us in London two weeks ago and was telling us that they had um, figured out how to parse and we actually have a Zapier integration that would make this use case even easier but the way they were describing is they, they were parsing the incoming um, notifications that are that come out of Smileback and every time there was a positive one that they had a light that went off and, and an a audio clip of people clapping and that and then they had even gone so far as to figure out which engineer was connected to that and it would say their name and this was going out wow. like auditorially in the office and so it would be like yay Joseph you know <laughs> I was like you know I love the creativity that um, that you know is there and people harness to kind of you know connect the dots on this stuff it's really effective I love it any plans to implement that something that that direct functionality <laughs> Yeah, um, it's a great idea. We've talked about uh, bringing some audio in, in when when new reactions come in. Um, you know, we see. I mentioned Zapier, and I'll just quickly make a plug for Zapier because um, it's really. Uh, transformed what we've been able to do internally with all of our various SaaS applications that we depend on to run to run Smileback. Um, but we built also our platform. Smileback integrates with Zapier, and so I mean, you know, the use like what you can do with Zapier and uh, the ecosystem of of applications that have their own Zapier integrations is really amazing. One of my favorite things is a client provide feedback through Smileback, and then you connect that through Zapier to a company that sends cookies in the mail, like oh, biscuits, wow. you know? Very cool, yeah. And, uh, like, that's totally possible today. You don't have to even build the parts yourself. Like, it's these, you know, you kind of connect the dots between Smileback and Zapier and Zapier to that company, and you literally have, like, treats going out in the post. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. <laughs> I love that. That would be awesome. Okay. Let's stay on the subject, if we yep. can, of, um, of positive feedback, positive reinforcement. Um, and I want to flip it around from uh, almost rewarding the uh, the clients for giving positive feedback to rewarding your employees. Um, it, there's a big argument, I guess it could be argued, that quality of service means doing less but better. And I'm interested to see whether you agree with that statement or not. But second part of this, how do you reward employees for delivering excellent customer service as opposed to rewarding them for just, you know, knocking off uh, high quantities of tickets? Well, you know, the data that our um, partners capture through Smileback becomes a really important backbone for um, evaluating and celebrating success of their staff. So, you know, the, the very, you know, the, the, the both the qualitative and quantitative data, so the feedback as expressed through the optional comments, but also the numbers that you get um, that you can derive from from the feedback itself, which, you know, what's the rate of positive versus negative and neutral, all of that. We have partners that are... Um, um, compiling that into monthly reports that go out to there's the team leads to say, okay, here's how your staff did this past month. Here are some of the comments that came in. Um, so we see we see that sort of reporting in place. We see uh, leaderboards where you're stack ranking um, staff members and displaying that up on a heads up display, for example, or a, you know, in their service center. So there's live reinforcement, you know, sort of encouragement of, okay, here are the people that are winning and, and trying to create a nice uh, atmosphere of camaraderie. Um, we think those are particularly effective. Um, you know, it's it's sort of this adage of, um, you know, uh, celebrate publicly and provide feedback or, you know, critical feedback privately. Um, we find that to be a really effective way of also approaching approaching this topic as well. Yeah, I like it. I've heard it um, referred to as catching people doing the right thing as, uh, as opposed to catching them doing the wrong thing. That's uh, it's unusual and it works. Exactly. Yeah. So um, 
before we move off the subject of, of positive uh, customer service, mm-hmm. uh, on, on a personal level, uh, has there been any moments recently where you've been blown away, personally, Brad, by exceptional customer service, and it doesn't just have to be within the IT arena? Yeah, I, uh, I was flying um, on a small... I'll tell you a story, and it starts out really awful, and it ends <laughs> amazingly. Um, it's uh, I was flying on a... I was in sort of Bakersfield, California, flying, catching a commuter uh, flight from Bakersfield to San Francisco. This was uh, last summer. And uh, I don't know what was happening, if the stars were misaligned or Mercury was in retrograde or if I just had like a bad expression on my face, but I had this really awful encounter with the gate agent and um, it felt very personal. Like I had, like, I don't know, punched her puppy or something I don't know what you know like I hadn't done any of that of course because I'm not a monster but something I don't know what it was could have been who knows but she was really rude really and to the point where she wouldn't even let me talk like I would start to talk and she would just interrupt me and I said I said could I and I was really I was trying I, I actually was really proud that I kept a very even tone and I and I you know I didn't let, I was really able to kind of hold back the extreme amount of frustration I was feeling. I just said, I was like, could you please just let me finish my sentences? And she goes, ah, it doesn't matter. I don't care what you have to say. And I was like, wow, I don't, wow. I really, like, the situation went from zero to super um, nasty in like four seconds. And I was really, like, taken off guard. Needless to say, I board my flight and I was really upset. I was sort of physically shaking and and I really wanted to lash out and I started to do that to the poor flight attendant and she she just said, You know what? We're gonna you and I are gonna have a great flight together. Come on board. I'm gonna make like we're gonna like it's gonna be fine. You're now with me. She said it with like this really radiant smile and it was comp- it was really genuine and it was heartfelt. And my added my, my whole like, you know, this little storm cloud that was like thunderbolting above me disappeared immediately and I was like, Wow, that that is a skillful response, right? Yeah. And I've come to learn, you know, I was um, doing a little reading around non-complementary um, behavior where, you know, as humans, we tend to um, react with kind, with the same. So, so you're, you come up to me and you're frustrated and I act with a sort of a negative emotion back, right? Like that's sort of what we naturally do as humans. It's like happiness with happiness and sadness with, you know, frustrate, whatever. And she, um, and, and what takes a really, what takes a lot of skill is to do the opposite. So when somebody's being mean or is frustrated or is really, you know, angry to come at them with something that's not, you know, with something that's the opposite, it takes a lot of skill. And I, I really respected this um, flight attendant. And I really like it. it my, my mood lifted and like life was okay and good again. Um, so <laughs> that's a recent example that, um, you know, felt really great to be a part of in the end. I love it. That's a great story. Yeah. Uh, and on the on the topic of uh, customer service, you, you know, I look up to you, and I'm not alone. In you're a customer service expert. You know a lot about the science behind this, and you you put it into smile about the product. Do you ever find yourself when you're walking into the local news agents or a restaurant? Do you ever find yourself looking at customer service with perhaps a more critical eye than you did previously? Yeah, I, I you know, actually, it, let's critical eye and more just a lot of empathy um you know for as much as we talk about this and and live this topic here at the company like you know i still can be an annoying customer in (laughs) my daily life right and like you know i'm all i'm still subject to all of the like you know deficiencies that we have as humans in terms of being not patient or snippy or whatever and um so i just i see the whole thing with a lot of empathy for through you know, for both parts, the, you know, the people that are on the ground trying to work with customers and dealing with some un- other n- untold number of stresses in their, both their personal and professional lives and, and how we come together. And for some brief moment, we have some exchange and trying to make the best of that. Um, I don't know. I just have a lot of empathy to it. Um, I guess is really the emotion that is kind of predominant these days of, we're, you know, in some ways we're, we're all trying to figure out how to, you know, get through the day and somehow survive intact. And on the best of days, we're able to um, manifest a more skilled response, right? Kindness in the face of uh, annoyance or patience in the face of, uh, you know, what seems like a stupid question, right? I don't know. That's what I strive for. I'm, you know, 
once in a while I achieve it and I, I celebrate those days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on that. I achieve it once in a while as well, but, um, but we always live in hope that that becomes the norm. So let's uh, switch uh, direction a little bit. Let's talk about the product specifically, uh, Smileback. So Smileback at the moment, you've got integration with ConnectWise, a very, very popular PSA tool, um, professional services automation tool that lots of IT companies use. You've got integration with Dropbox. Um, any plans for integration with any of the other platforms? And, and specifically, if I can, Brad, the, the one that I got the most questions about um, was Autotask, the other, the other biggest PSA yeah. tool out there. Yeah, we're, we're, we're committed to doing it. Um, we, you know, it's been an interesting journey because we rebranded last year to reflect what we, you know, what had become the focus for us as a company, which is this, and the success that we've been having with our, our feedback platform. Um, and we did that to set us up for this year and next year uh, expanding out, really integrating our platform with other help desk systems, with other ticketing solutions. Autotask is very much on um, on the radar here. Um, we have already undertaken a number of initiatives uh, on sort of behind the scenes in terms of how we're storing data, how we're thinking about it, the data models themselves, how we're actually accepting information. We've, we've generified that, so to say, so that will apply to um, to the integrations that will launch. Of, of course, none of that's probably very uh, satisfying to hear because you don't see it yet, but we're working on it. Um, Part of it's been ramping up the team, which we've been doing over the last six months. We've added a few key positions. Um, so we're, we're committed to doing it. Uh, we're excited to do it because we think there's a lot of success that we've had with ConnectWise partners. And, you know, we, uh, we lose almost no companies on our platform. It, it happens occasionally, but one of the... You know, when we look at churn in a, in a SaaS company, that can, it's one of those key, key metrics that um, uh, really defines the trajectory of the overall business. One of the categories of churn that we experience is ConnectWise partners leaving to Autotask. I don't mean to say that that's a common thing, but of the churn that we experience, like something like 30% or 20% of it is uh, companies wanting to keep using our product, but going to Autotask. So one of the ways we can kind of, you know, cut cut that little sliver out or eliminate that would be to obviously be able to go to, to follow their their migration be with the with the MSP through their own journey of changing backend systems um, but yeah but back to your topic yeah, it, it's it's one we're really keen on um, we you know as I said been laying a lot of the foundation and I expect we'll see see some exciting developments on that later this year Cool. I should look forward to that. I've had uh, the overwhelming um, question we had was about Autotask. I think you've addressed that. Um, Harmony PSA, that's another tool that seems to be growing in popularity um, here in the UK, especially people okay. asked about that. Um, one, of, one of your uh, customers, uh, Ari Santiago, asked a very <laughs> specific question, which I thought was a good one. Um, he asked, um, is there any chance that Smileback is going to um, implement decision maker surveys? Um, I can elaborate on that, but I think you understand what he means by that. Yeah, I uh, and I appreciated the um, the the discourse, the discussion on LinkedIn that was happen that was happening in advance of this. Um, gave me some also some insight into kind of what the questions that are on the mind of of our partners. Um, so decision making, I, I interpret that to mean more periodic surveys that may go to kind of the account holder, the account key account contact within the the customer company. Um, we haven't decided not to do it. It's it's a different it's a different uh, solution, right? It's a different problem. So I don't think we've quite figured out how to do it successfully. We definitely see the need and you know, and also um, the benefit that comes out of asking and getting feedback in that mode, which is periodic and maybe asking for a little bit more in depth feedback. Totally get it, and we, we, you know, we 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 see that as a as an important element to an understanding the customer journeys we've talked about. Um, I don't think we've quite figured out, um, you know, how we can do it in our way and do it successfully. So, you know, it's something that comes up frequently, and and we look at, and um, but we haven't we haven't made a decision to to do it at this moment. No. Fair enough. So let's focus on Smileback as a business and perhaps uh, your, your own entrepreneurial journey and the things that you've, you've learned. Um, what's the biggest pain point that you've been experiencing within your business these days? Yeah, I think um, it's hiring and retaining 
great staff, right? Um, this is... There's going to be a lot of people nodding heads as they listen to that <laughs> everywhere in the world, yeah. Indeed. I mean, it is a very uh, classic challenge for organizations, right? So we're not unique in that way, on that, at least on that front. Um, and it's something that... Um, yeah, we, you know, it's just a classic trying to find the right people that are kind of at a moment in their overall cur- career journey that matches up nicely with what we're trying to accomplish in the company and obviously connecting with them, but then convincing them to come be a part of our collect, you know, our journey um, and adventure. It's, um, it's something, yeah, I don't know if I've ever... I don't know if I've cracked the nut yet and I, maybe there's not, maybe that's not even the way to look at it that um, for me it's kind of a, a set of ongoing efforts in terms of understanding the contributions that its staff make and figuring out how we as a company can create an atmosphere that allows, you know, talented, bright, dedicated, energized individuals to come in and be and make their contributions. Um, so that's, a, that's the thing that we face the most. Um, the mechanics and the finances and building products, sure, they all have their own um, interesting challenges and problems to, to solve. But I would say it's the people elements that, that's, that's the most important, I would say. Good. Now, you're really open and honest. I've spoken to you about business a number of times, and you've shared really openly and honestly. So I'm going to take advantage of that and put you mm-hmm. on the spot again, Brad. Um, what's been your most unpopular idea of the past few months? And why was it unpopular? Oh, um, you know, I, uh, lots of things from my personal life. Uh, you know, I'll tell you the story of my little my journey of, of kind of emigrating out of the U.S. And I wouldn't, um, wouldn't say that I'll never go back. I feel... Um, with the risk of maybe be getting a little political, I, you know, Germany is this sort of level-headed place in the world right now <laughs> that I really respect and I really um, wish we had more of. It's this. Um, so my, you know, it's uh, yeah, it's this, it's it's a Germans have done a really excellent job of, you know, creating this kind of non-reactive culture and um, you know, a very typical response is like, mm, interesting. Let me think about that, you know, or. I'm not sure how I feel. Let me let's let me have a couple days to think about that. And I just think there's um, I just think we need more of that. To be honest, I think it's a good strategy. It's a good way of um, not becoming reactive to all the various things that go on in our lives. So that's you know talking about that has been a little it's created a little unpopularity for me amongst my compatriots. Um, you know, it's I live between these two cultures. Um, the U.S. Is, is obviously my home. It's where I'm from. And, um, you know, as, as much as I've become sort of German by living in Berlin, and I say that in air quotes because I think that's those are the kind of changes that take a lifetime to take effect. But I'm also very aware of my Americanism, right, and being here. So I don't know if that directly answers your question, but, you know, there's there's a lot about the German view of the world that is, um, is I've really in, adopted as my own. And, um, and it flies a little bit in the face of kind of current, mm, yeah, uh, thinking. Uh, yeah, you know, I hear you. That's many big political problems, you know, challenges that we're facing as as humans these days. Yeah, and you're not alone. In, I'm a huge fan of German culture. Uh, my best friend is German. In fact, I'm going to pick up the phone to, to Felix after mm-hmm. this and uh, uh, catch up with him. I was in Hanover a few weeks ago and um, was just marveling at the customer service. Even when I was being a little bit snippy, dare we say, as we put in British terms, mm-hmm. you know, perhaps I wasn't controlling my emotions as well. Customer service was really good there. So absolutely love um, uh, German culture. Um, if I can stay on the subject of um, you know what you do on a day-to-day basis and how you manage the business, is there a productivity tool that you use every single day to keep your house in order? Yeah, there are many. Um, the one that I basically live in all day and I'm um, is Slack. I mean, it's yeah. they've, they've, they've built a phenomenal tool. Um, I really marvel at it. It's um, you know, I'm kind of a, I kind of have high standards. Um, <laughs> That's probably not a, a, a surprise to you because you've known me for a few <laughs> years. Um, but, you know, Slack is one of those products that I respect because they've just, they've really nailed it. Um, and it's replaced email communication. We don't send emails at all internally anymore. It's allowed us to create and um, 
take lots of side conversations that used to happen on the side with within a closed circle and make those public and within I mean you know in the context of our company make those visible and give everybody access to the information that's and the discussion that's happening um, so as a result like you know I have a few emails that come in and it's all with kind of external partners of uh, people that we we work with obviously outside of the company and that's what email has now become but all of our internal communication happens in slack we've also been able to use the kind because it really is a platform, been able to um, all of these various systems like our credit card processing with, that happens with Stripe and you know our subscription billing, um, you know things that are happening on the sales and marketing front. Those sort of data points are all getting published back into Slack as notifications, and so we have these little you know blips of information that kind of come in throughout the day that the entire staff can can look at and you know really quickly get a sense for how things are going whereas we'd have to for example collate that and do that on a monthly basis as a report but who in the end does always take has the initiative and the discipline to really do that so it's just, it's created a ton of visibility it's an amazing product um Really, it's something I'm proud to to use, and and um, I really respect what they've done with it with the product. Yeah, huge fan of Slack here. We use it with the internal team, and a lot of the communities I'm involved with use it as well. So, can't well, speak highly enough of Slack. Um, now, next question: If you could give one piece of advice to aspiring entrepreneurs, what would that piece of advice be? Yeah, um, I'll tell you what I tell sort of. Uh, you know, when, in those times that I've talked to some of the younger folks that are kind of getting their start in the world and kind of coming out of university and thinking about, okay, how can I, how can I fit into this very complex puzzle that is um, the world today? The thing I always encourage them to do is to realize and to study business models, right? And maybe see not the most exciting you know, thing. But if you think about it, everything has a model. Every organization, every department within every company, every company itself, you, whether the, whether or not they're trying to make money as a mission of the, you know, like for profit versus nonprofit, every team, every organization has some sort of business model. They have some number of variables that, when you can understand what those are, then you can start really, you can do these some really interesting things around. Um, producing outcomes, right? Producing results, literally, right? So for me, I feel like that's been my lifelong journey is first having that key insight years ago that every every business has a business model and then really seeking out and trying to understand what are all the levers and dials that have to be managed and, and dialed in and, and, and tuned over time to actually produce some positive result. And I, I you know, I've just been, I'm fascinated. Maybe it sounds a little dry, but um, it is really understanding the world and how it works and all of the complex systems and things that interconnect to um, build this great place, you know, this planet that we live on. So business models, study them. They, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. I like it. So I'm very conscious of time. Uh, yep. I feel like I could talk to you for the rest of the day, Brad, but you've actually got a business uh, to get on a run and so have high. So as, as we uh, draw things down here, um, Quick question about Smileback um, from the MSP perspective. Um, how would an MSP with ConnectWise wanting to try Smileback, how can they get started? Is there a free trial, for instance, where they can dip in? Yep, we offer a 14-day free trial. Mm -hmm. We uh, get on the phone with our uh, prospective partners and uh, fully implement the product. So we get the survey in place and... Um, feedback starts coming in the moment it goes live and it's been one of the one of the great things about it the way we've built the product um, we're, we're able to get smile back rolled out very easily within usually a, a 20 25 30 minute phone call uh, screen sharing we get that all set up um, so that's something we offer um, that uh, can anybody listening is who's interested in that can go to our website smileback.io and um, to the contact page and, and click there to to let, let us know that you'd like to start a free trial. Um, so yeah, we absolutely offer that. Fantastic. Cool. Um, and anybody who wants to get in touch with you directly, Brad, to continue the conversation, we've already mentioned LinkedIn. I know you're on there. Um, Twitter. Yep. Uh, Twitter, I have to say, I'm a I'm a failing Twitterer. Um, <laughs> you know, I have an account, but you know, I, I have a I, what I realized last year is that I have a limited amount of social media, and every time I add one, one one pops out. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. at some point, um, Twitter so link, pops so out. So LinkedIn, LinkedIn is the best way to get a hold of you. Uh, do you mind sharing your email address as well, if anybody wants? Not to at all. Um, yeah, so just my name, Brad at uh, smileback.io, all like it sounds. 
Fantastic. So just before we go, Brad, what's next for Smileback? What can we expect over the next few months? Yeah, like I said, as, and as we discussed earlier, we're working on in, you know integrating our platform with a um, number of ticketing systems. Autotask is 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 squarely on that list. Um, uh, that's a big, a lot big opportunity for us as a company, but there's also a fairly significant engineering effort that's going into that. Um, we're working on um, also an API that will allow customers to programmatically interact with the information that we're collecting on their behalf, the feedback. Um, also setting up um, the ability for third-party platforms to uh, pull the information that we're collecting and start integrating our platform into their functionality. So that's something that's that we're also working on. There's always, uh, you know, improvements from a UX perspective. We got a fairly, we have a fairly um, large initiative defined to completely revamp the analytics experience, uh, the data experience within within our platform. Um, so there's some key, some fairly fundamental, also some fairly significant projects that we're working on that we'll be excited to debut in the coming months. Cool. Well, we should keep an eye uh, with interest on your progress. I've no doubt you're going to be successful with it. Um, very proud on a personal level of what you've achieved as thank one you. of the uh, post MSP group um, who have gone on to great yep. things. Uh, thank you for spending time with us today. Given the amount of feedback that we've had on social media already, I strongly suspect that people are going to want to see you back for another uh, block of time soon. Can we uh, can we lean on you for that at some point in the future, maybe? I know you're a busy man. Richard, that would be so much my pleasure. I, you don't have to frame it as, uh, as, as I'm doing you a favor. It would really be my delight to do that. Bless you all. Thanks very much. Bye. Brad Benner, um, appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Richard. Thanks for listening to Tub Talk, the podcast for IT business owners. You can find the show notes and bonus content for this interview, along with dozens of other interviews with IT business leaders over at www.tubblog.co.uk. If you enjoyed this podcast, then we'd really appreciate you rating and reviewing the show over at iTunes. Every review helps us reach new listeners and helps raise the bar for success in the IT industry. In our next episode, Richard speaks with Michael George, the CEO of Network Operations Centre Provider Continuum. Thanks for listening, and I'll speak with you next episode. Have a great day. Okay, I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors, The Email Laundry. The Email Laundry combines security services with your customer's preferred email service to give them a truly enterprise-worthy email system. Well, what does that mean? Well, as an IT business, whether your customers are using Office 365, Hosted Exchange, an on-site exchange server, or any other type of email solution, cloud-based email security from The Email Laundry is a neat and effective solution for your customer. It will block spam and virus email with an impressive catch rate. Put simply, when your customer's email server is protected behind the email laundry, they'll thank you for the security it offers them. Now, the email laundry are offering free email security for your own domain to all listeners to this podcast. All you have to do is to sign up for a free partner account through the special listener URL, www.theemaillaundry.com forward slash to blog. Use that link to have your own domain filtered for free for one year. And there's more to this special offer. If you bring on board 100 paying mailboxes during your first six months, the email laundry will give you your own domain for free for another 12 months. So that means two years of the email laundry service for your own domain for free. Sign up for the email laundry now using the special listener offer at www.theemaillaundry.com forward slash tublog. Hey team, this is Richard again. Just one more thing before you take off, and that is MSP Insights. Now, every Tuesday, I share my thoughts on the business of IT with you, the managed service community. Thousands of managed service providers already subscribe to MSP Insights. It's easy to sign up, easy to cancel. MSP Insights is basically a short email from me every Tuesday without fail with advice on growing your IT business, plus cool resources I found, discovered, or started exploring that week. It's kind of like my diary 
diary of cool things and often includes articles or books I've read, tools I've discovered and events I think you'd be interested in, often sent to me by my friends and Tub Talk podcast guests. So if that sounds fun, a short tiny bite of MSP goodness every Tuesday and you'd like to try it out, just go to go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. That's gogo.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.